Hello everyone, we are group 4 and we will be discussing about the Regime Watch Dial Painters. But before that, let me give you first a short introduction about the topic. Regime was discovered by Nobel laureate Marie Curie and her husband Pierre in 1898. It is one type of radioactive material that could be found in antiques. People were fascinated by the mysterious glow of radium, so it was added to many everyday products, including paints. These paints were used on the dials of clocks and watches to make them glow in the dark. A century ago, glow-in-the-dark watches were an irresistible novelty. The dials, covered in a special luminous paint, shone all the time and didn't require charging in sunlight. Regium dials are watch, clock, and other apparatuses that are painted with radioluminescent paint containing radium-226. We all know that radium is highly radioactive, which has a high half-life period. So it can be said that these watches are not safe. They radiate while glowing, which causes harm to those who uses it. However, one of the first factories to produce these watches opened in New Jersey in 1916. It hired about 70 women, the first of thousands to be employed in many such factories. The Radium Girls were female factory workers who contracted radiation poisoning from painting watch dials with self-luminous paint. The painting was done by women at three different factories, and the term now applies to the women working at the facilities. One in Orange, New Jersey, beginning around 1917. One in Ottawa, Illinois, beginning in the early 1920s, and a third facility in Waterbury, Connecticut. The Radium Dial Company was established in Ottawa, Illinois in 1922, and the town's former high school. Like the United States Radium Corporation, the purpose of the studio in Ottawa was to paint dials for clocks, their largest client being West Clocks Corporation in Peru, Illinois. Dials painted in Ottawa appeared on West Clock's popular Big Ben, Little Ben, and Travel Clocks. And like United States Radium Corporation, Radium Dial hired young women to paint the dials using the same lip dip paint approach as the women in New Jersey and by another unaffiliated plant in Waterbury, Connecticut that supplied the Waterbury Clock Company. At the onset of World War I, several factories were established across the United States to produce watches and military dials painted with a material containing radium. It is a radioactive element that glows in the dark. And hundreds of young women were hired for well-paying painting jobs because their small hands were well sorted for the exacting detailed work. Radium had been discovered just 20 years earlier by French physicist Marie Curie and Pierre Curie, and its properties were not well known. But because it had been used successfully in the treatment of cancer, many considered radium a miracle element. And a variety of commercial products were manufactured in which radium was an ingredient including toothpaste and cosmetics. The woman hired to paint dials came to be known as ghost girls. Ghost girls because the radium dust to which they were exposed daily made their clothes, hair, and skin literally glow. Many of the women wore their best dresses in the job so the fabric would shine brightly when they went dancing after work. And some even applied the paint to their teeth because it gave them radiant smile. The painters ingested the radioactive substance as part of their job because some of the watch dials in which they work were extremely small. So they were instructed to use their lips to bring their paint brushes to a fine point. And when they asked about radium safety, they were assured by their managers that they had nothing to worry about. But of course that wasn't true. Because radium can be extremely dangerous, especially with repeated exposure. It wasn't long before the radium girls began to experience the physical ravages 
of their exposure. Among the first was Amelia Moli Maja, who painted watches for the Radium Luminous Material Corp. Her first symptoms was a toothache, which required the removal of the tooth. And soon, the tooth next to it also had to be extracted. Painful ulcers, bleeding, and polypus developed where the teeth had been. The mysterious malady spread throughout Maja's mouth and lower jaw, which had to be removed then into other parts of her body. On September 12, 1922, Maja died of a massive hemorrhage. Even doctors were puzzled as to the cause of her condition. Other radium girls become deathly ill, experiencing many of the same agonizing symptoms as Maja. For two years, their employer denied any connection between the girls' deaths and their work. Facing a downturn in business because of the growing controversy, the company finally commissioned an independent study of the matter, which concluded that the painters had died from the effects of radium exposure. Refusing to accept the report's findings, the company commissioned additional studies that came to the opposite conclusion and it decried the girls who had taken ill. The public continued to assume that radium was safe. Until 1925, a pathologist named Harrison Martland developed a test that proved conclusively that radium had poisoned the watch painters by destroying their bodies from the inside. The radium industry tried to discredit Martland's findings, but the radium girls themselves fought back. In 1927, attorney Raymond Barry agreed to accept their case. Many of the watch painters had just months to leave and were forced to accept an out-of-court settlement. Still, their experiences made the issue of radium safety a front-page story across the world. But even then, the United States Radium Corporation denied its rule, and women continued to get sick and die. It wasn't until 1938, when a dying radium worker named Catherine Wolf Dunoe successfully sued the Radium Dial Corporation over her illness that the issue was finally settled. The legacy of the Radium Girls can't be understated. Their case was among the first in which a company was held responsible for the health and safety of its employees. And it led to a variety of reforms as well as to the creation of the U.S. In 1916, dial painting was a trending new profession for American and Canadian women. Hundreds of women worked in clock factories during World War I, where they painted watch dial painters with glow-in-the-dark radium paint. Workers were instructed to suck their paint brushes to make a fine point. What was worse that the radium companies feed the public the lie that a small amount of radium is actually good for you. They even have grocery products and cosmetics, but the luminous element had a devastating side. And it wasn't long before the after effects of the radium paint began to show. It began with a toothache and quickly led to anemia, bone fractures, and necrosis of jaw, a condition that became known as radium jaw, while the radium girls were instructed to ingest the dangerous mixture. According to Kate Moore, the author of the radium girls, scientists know that the radium was hazardous, but the radium companies insisted that Small amount were beneficial to help. Kate Moore researched her book starting with the story of Molly Magia, a former worker at Dial Painting Factory. In 1922, a 24-year-old Molly died. Her death was described painful and terrible. Doctors told her family that she died in sepilis, but her family did not believe this. That false diagnosis was later used against her in the court. Magia might have the first radium girl to die, and many of her co-workers followed. And by 1927, more than 50 women had died and while others suffered from ongoing illness and permanent injuries. Radium was not suspected at first, because the official line was that it was safe in small doses. 
According to Moore, instead of radium firm suspending the dial painting, the managers refused to accept any responsibility and vowed to find the real cause of the woman's illness. Then, 1925, Dr. Harrison Martland discovered that radium had deposited women's bones. He created tests that proved it was the radium that was poisoning the factory workers. In 1927, five former dial painters led by Catherine Dunuhu and represented by lawyer Leonard Guzman filed case against the U.S. Radium Corporation. During the case, the body of Molly Magia was exhumed and taken away for an autopsy. An autopsy soon proved that each every portion of tissue and bone gave evidence of radioactivity. It took eight appeals before the former radium girls finally had a victory, the lasting legacy of the women's fight to lead to the new introduction of new safety standards to protect a whole new generation of dial painters. According to Elizabeth Richter, she concluded that while the histories of the radium dial painters can be read simply as tragedies, they should be better remembered for the significant roles they played in advancing legislative labor and research on radium. The radium company's negligence led to shorter lives for many of their employees and should be a reminder of the importance labor regulations play in workers' safety. Yet their stories fit into a contextual narrative that is a result of the times. In the early 20th century, many reformers across the United States were striving to better protect workers and advocated for unions of all demographics, including women. The radium dial painters' cases helped to affirm that acts, such as the Occupational Disease Act, were indeed constitutional and need to be upheld. The dial painters helped to set safety regulations for government employees, allowing for them to continue working on radioactive materials throughout the Cold War while still protecting workers. Although they did not receive the proper protection from their own companies, the dial painters helped to prevent future cases such as their from happening. She tried several different positions, but she was never able to register even the slightest uptick in radiation. In fact, a few hours earlier, she had tested the newly purchased device on her cat as one does, and she registered a slightly higher reading than she ever received at either grave. Both graves registered an average of 0.10 to 0.13 microsieverts per hour. Real panic doesn't begin until way past the 0.8 range and readings of above 1 indicate a serious cancer risk with prolonged exposure. Due to what happened between the radium girls, Joseph Kelly opened a new factory named Luminous Process. Under this factory, there is no more lip pointing and he promised the safer condition than the old one, but it happened that there is radium everywhere inside and out and people in town got sick. Then last 2006, Illinois 8th grader Madeline Peller organized a drive to build a monument honoring for dial painters. To make it successful, everyone helped even the mayor of the town to raise money for the monument and now there is a bronze statue of a young woman holding a paintbrush and it stands near a site of all luminous process plant. There is also a new artisan brewery founded area locals and named in honor of the women, Radium City Brewing. Due to the damages caused by radium, it has no longer used in watch and clocks since 1970. And to make it continued without having kind of trouble, the radium replaced by phosphorescent or occasionally tritium-based light sources.